we're going to explore the dark side, negative numbers. Now these are things you've already seen. For example, we talk about degrees below zero. So on our scale, zero is pretty cold. We don't see it much here in Tucson, if at all. But what about 20 degrees below zero? There are certainly many parts of the country that get temperatures like that. And of course, every winter we have people coming here to escape from those below zero temperatures. When we talk about motion, we, for example, also have to talk about direction. So we can go north and south. And in a sense, we can call, if we go, say if we go north, say we're going in a positive direction. If we go south, we're going in a negative direction. Velocity. If you're going forwards, if you're moving this way, towards something, you say you're going in the positive direction. If you're backing up, moving backwards, you can say you're going in the negative direction. So that we can give positive and negative a meaning in terms of which direction we're traveling as well as how fast we're going. Are we going towards something, straight ahead, or are we backing up? So we see we use these ideas every day, maybe even without thinking about it. Now here's one you use all the time, or I know I do. Suppose you owe someone money. In a way, that's like having a negative amount of money because until you've paid it, you can't really say you have any money. So uh, debt and dealing with owing things is another use that we always have of positive and negative numbers. Here's another one. You're looking at the ocean, and we can draw a line here right at the shore that's sea level. And if you're talking about mountains, you say a mountain is so many feet above sea level. We can consider that positive. On the other hand, um, if we go down into the ocean, uh, we can talk about negative. And so we have positive and negative associated with sea level. And to get these ideas set in our head, we use something called the number line, where we have a zero in the middle and positive numbers to the right, negative numbers to the left. Let's explore that a little bit. We call the zero point the origin because it's where numbers originate, where numbers start. and we call the both positive and negative numbers the integers. It's a specific name, and when you say integers, you're talking about positive and negative numbers together as a group. The way this is usually written is that positive numbers increase to the right, and things get less and less and less. You, get, you go into more and more and more money that you owe as you go to the left. Now, this is just a convention, just a naming convention, but you ha everybody has to agree to what the convention is. And my guess is, of course, being left-handed, is that right is positive because so many people are right-handed. They're the majority. They make the rules. Us left-handed people have to suffer with whatever's left over, so left is negative, right is positive, according to the common conventions of math. Now, you don't have to be only horizontal to have a number line. You can also have a number line vertical, as we saw with above sea level, positive, below sea level, negative. Before we continue, let's look at a little video I made that would help to reinforce this idea. Ever since I knew they had this thing, I've been looking for an excuse to try it. And telling you about the number line provided just that excuse. Here we go. Here we go. Wow, where's my oxygen mask? We're up at plus five. Zero, the origin. Plus two. Minus two. Well, I guess I've gotten the ride I wanted, and you got to see a little bit about the number line. 
Now with that, you have an idea of how the number line works. Let's look at actually locating numbers on the number line itself. So if we had a 2, where would we put it? There. A 4, here. Negative 1 or minus 1, here. And minus 4, here. Now we can talk about what numbers are greater than or less than others. As you go from left to right on the number line, the numbers go up in value. So let's take a look at some of these things. There's a 4, there's a 3, and since 3 is to the left of 4, we say that 4 is larger than 3. 4 is to the right of 3, 4 is greater than 3. 3 is less than 4, to flip the inequality around. Now if we have a 2 and a minus 1 and minus 3, we can say that minus 1 is greater than minus 3. Why? Because if I owed someone a dollar, I would have more money than if I owed them three dollars. Mathematically, you can see that minus 3 is to the left of minus 1 on the number line, so that numbers to the left are smaller, numbers to the right are larger. 1 is, minus 1 is less than 2. Again, minus 1 is to the left of 2 on the number line. Are you ready to try it? How about minus 45, minus 56? Minus 45 is greater than minus 56. Minus 12 is less than 2. 23 is greater than minus 6. And minus 19 is less than minus 4. You have to be careful about numbers that are negative because 19 on the face of it looks like it's bigger than 4. But if you think about where it is on the number line, it's to the left of 4 on the number line, therefore is smaller. And again, ask yourself the question, would you rather owe $4 or $19? I would rather owe the 4. 4 is a bigger number than 19. Let's look at a definition now of number opposites. We have 2 and minus 2 there on the number line, and two numbers that are the same distance from 0 but in opposite directions are called opposites. They're also called additive inverses. So the opposite of 2 is minus 2. The opposite of minus 2 is plus 2. And here's the thing about opposites or additive inverses. If you add together additive inverses, they add to 0. Plus 2 plus a minus 2 adds to 0. So if I have $2, and then I give someone $2 I owe them, I'm left with nothing. Let's look at another couple of examples. There's the number line, and there's minus 4 and plus 4. The opposite of 4 is minus 4, and the opposite of minus 4 is plus 4. In general, if you have a negative number, and we take the opposite of the negative number, we get a positive number. And that gives us a piece of very useful information. The opposite of a negative number is a positive number. Therefore, if I have in math minus a minus, that gives me a positive. So if in a mathematical expression I see minus a minus, I can change those two minus signs to a plus. Very useful information based on the definition of opposites. We can also now look at another um, topic or another definition in this mathematics of integers uh, that has a lot to do with opposites, and that's absolute value. And the absolute value is this. If I go from 0 on the number line to 5 one way, 0 on the number line to 5 the other way, even though I wind up in one case with plus 5, the other case at minus 5, I have walked or I have moved or traveled the same distance. So if I 
look at how far I go, not the direction, but just the distance, that is called the absolute value. And the way it's indicated is with two bars. So I have bars minus five, and what I'm really talking about when I see those things with the parallel bars, I'm talking about not going to the left, but just looking at how far I've gone. So the absolute value of minus five is five. Similarly, how far have I gone if I've walked five to the right? The absolute value of five is five. So either way, the absolute value is a positive number, and whether the integer inside is positive or negative, the absolute value is positive because it's the distance you walk regardless of the direction you go in. Now you have to be a little bit careful here because you need to distinguish between parentheses, which just classify mathematical operations, as we said before, minus a minus three is plus three because I have minus a minus. But it's easy to get confused with minus an absolute value. The absolute value symbol with the minus three in it is positive. So minus the absolute value of minus three is the same as saying minus a plus three or just minus three. So the negative of any absolute value is also negative. It's different from taking the negative of something in parentheses. So be careful whether those brackets are curved where it just acts like a regular number or the brackets are up and down indicating that you're dealing with an absolute value. Now, let's talk about adding numbers, adding numbers of the same sign. So there's the number line, and there are the integers. Suppose I want to add 2 and 3 to get 5. I can do this by thinking of these numbers going in a particular direction. So on the number line, and using the number line to add 2 plus 3, what I can do is walk two, then walk three more, so I see I've walked a total of five units. This is case one, where all the numbers are positive, and they add just like regular addition. And where you have a case one, you can suspect there might be a case two. Let's look at it. So if we have a minus two and add that to a minus three, Let's see how that works out on the number line. We walk minus 2 to the left, then we walk minus 3 to the left, and ask where we wind up. We wind up minus 5 to the left on the number line from the origin. So minus 2 plus a minus 3 is equal to minus 5. Let's see if we can generalize this. If we have two negative numbers and try to add them together, they add exactly like positive numbers, except that the result, the sum, the answer, whatever you'd like to call it, is also negative. Minus 5 plus a minus 6 is minus 11, and so forth. So our rule is to add integers with the same sign you add the numbers together and retain whatever the sign was. So if we have two positive numbers or two negative numbers, we add them and then the sign is either positive or negative. Plus two plus four is plus six. Minus three plus a minus one is minus four. Notice how we've written the plus a minus one. We indicate that so that we can see that the number we're adding to the minus 3 is minus 1. It helps to make the mathematics a little clearer so you don't have plus minus on the same line without indicating what's going on. Now let's go a step further and look at adding integers with different signs. So if I have 4 and I go 4 that way, and add a minus 3 to that, let's see what happens. I get plus 1 because 
if I look at ultimately how far I've moved from the origin after walking to the right four and to the left three, where do I wind up? I wind up at plus one. And if we want to write it more simply, instead of having bracket plus one, that translates just to one, so we can write it a little more simply. You put brackets in when you want to make sure that no one makes a mistake with your notation. The brackets don't mean anything, except in, in, if we have long arrays, it'll tell you what to add or subtract first, but often we also put the parentheses in to make clear what we're doing. Let's look at another case. In this case, the positive is larger than the negative. So if we go four to the right and three back, we find out we're at plus one. And it looks like if we have a mixed case where the positive number is larger, it works just like regular subtraction. Let's look at the fourth case. I'll bet you can figure out what that is. Suppose we have a two and go two to the right. Then we have a minus five that we add to it and go minus five to the left. And we ask if we started from the origin, from zero, where we would wind up. We see that we would wind up at minus three. Let's look at this again added the other way, just to make sure. Suppose we start at minus five, meaning we take a trip minus five to the left. Then we add the plus two, and where do we wind up? We still wind up at minus three. So either way we add those two, we wind up minus three. So in this case, the negative number was larger than the positive number. This is case four, and this is handled exactly like a regular subtraction. In other words, you can, subjust, you can just subtract the two from the five, but since the five is larger, it's going to, in a way, overpower it so that the answer will be negative. So here's a rule we can use. To add integers with different signs, we subtract the numbers to start with, subtract the smaller number from the larger number, then the answer, the result, has the sign of the larger value. For example, plus two minus four, since um, minus four is the larger of the values, we have the answer when we're done with the addition is minus two. If I have minus seven plus three, the minus seven is bigger, we subtract seven from three and get four, and the answer must be negative. Let's take a look at some problems. What about minus 345 plus a 56? We can imagine the number line where we move 56 this way and 345 this way. Where will our answer be? It's going to be minus something because when we put these head to tail, we're going to still be going quite a ways to the left. So the rules for different signs, we remember, we subtract the two numbers, then the answer has the sign of the larger. Let's do this. There's 345, and we subtract 56 from it to get 289, and the sign is the sign of the larger of those numbers. So it's, uh, our answer for this addition is minus 289. Let's look at another example minus 145 plus a minus 267. In this case, we again imagine the number line, and it's going to be minus something because we go to the left 145, then we go to the left another 267. Remember that for the same signs, we add the two numbers, and the answer has the same sign. So let's do that. If we add those numbers up, we're going to get 412. And since both numbers are negative, the answer will be minus 412. One more example. Minus 264 plus 812. So we start going to the left minus 264, and then we go to the right 
8.12, and when we're finished, we see we're going to be going plus something. And uh, uh, the 8.12 overwhelms the 264 in a sense. And remember the rule for different signs is subtract the numbers and the answer has the sign of the larger number. So we have 8.12 minus 264 and the answer is 548. Now this is a little bit more complex because we have brackets. We have 63 plus a minus 27, and we have to add the quantity 18 plus a minus 24. So we do two separate problems, but remember that we subtract the numbers for their both different signs, keep the sign of the larger. So in this case, we have 63 minus 27, so it's 36, and that's correct because we have the sign of the larger number. Then here I have minus 24, and 18, and I subtract the 18 from the 24 and keep the sign of the larger. Then I add those two together, and my final answer is 30. Let's look at another interesting problem. Uh, Chiron ultralight aircraft can travel 36 miles per hour in still air. What's its speed if it's traveling into a 17 mile an hour headwind in the opposite direction? So we first isolate what we're looking for. Um, what is the speed if it's traveling into a 17-mile headwind? What are we given? We're given that it can travel 36 miles an hour in still air, and we're given that there's a 17-mile-an-hour headwind. So there's the synopsis of what we're given. And this is what it would look like if we were laying it out on the number line. And notice that it's in the opposite direction because the headwind is against us. So our question is, what is the flying speed? So now let's perform the analysis. We know that the headwind slows the plane down so that our speed is going to be less. So our question is, what is that speed? We are going 36 miles per hour in one direction, coming back. 17 miles per hour. So it's 36 miles per hour plus or minus 17. Remember these are different signs so we subtract the numbers and use the sign of the larger number and our result for this is 19 miles per hour. Let's look at one more problem. A well driller bores a hole 375 feet down into the ground. Then underground springs fill up that hole to a level of 25 feet from the bottom. And what we want to know is what the minimum distance that the water must get pumped to the surface. Or in other words, what's the difference in where the water is to the surface. Let's do our mine for information. We see that we have the hole 375 feet down and the water fills up 26 feet from the bottom and we're asked what's the minimum distance the water must be pumped to get to the surface or what's the difference in level between the top of the water and the surface. Let's synopsize that information. We're given the well is 375 feet deep and it fills with 26 feet of water. We're asked what's the difference from the surface of the water to the top of the well. Next we should draw a diagram. And this is how I would do it with the origin at the surface of the well, the top of the well, and so the well goes down 375 feet, and then the water fills it up 26 feet. And we want to know what's the difference, what's the height of the um, going from the top of the well to the surface of the water. So here's our analysis. We need to find the distance to the surface, and that's the difference between the depth of the well and the top of the water. So we use minus 375 feet is the depth of the well. We're starting at zero, going down, plus 26 feet, the water goes up. We do the math, and remember, since the signs are different, we treat this as a subtraction, and the sign of the answer is the sign of the larger number. So it's minus 349 feet. 
So the question mark is 349 feet, and we use the minus sign to mean that the answer is down. The distance from the surface down to the top of the water is 349 feet, or minus 349 feet.